5. A company produces a range of solid and liquid wastes, both hazardous and non-hazardous. Identify the arrangements that should be in place to ensure the safe storage of the wastes prior to their collection and disposal. The hazardous nature of the waste. The waste may be inherently hazardous to staff involved in handling it, for example toxic or radioactive. This may require the use of PP. The waste may present a manual handling risk. This might be overcome by the use of mechanical handling equipment or handling aids. Storage equipment such as skips, bins and compactors may be difficult to access and may require steps or platforms to allow safe use. Waste containers, skips should be stored on concrete surfaces and not on unstable or unmade ground, grass or earth, to prevent contamination of ground and groundwater. Compactors will have moving parts that must be effectively guarded to prevent access. Collection vehicles such as skip lorries present a significant hazard when maneuvering, especially when reversing, use a banksman. The waste may present a temptation to scavengers, for example waste metals, and to vandals, unlocked storage tank valves, and so must be secured. Stored liquid waste should be contained in either a double skinned container or the vessel should be contained in a bund. Containers should be located away from bund walls. Bunds should have the capacity to store 110% of the volume of the largest container in the bund. Provision should be made to empty the bund of rainwater if the storage area is outside, or a roof installed to prevent rainwater ingress. Where liquids are pumped, transferred or decanted the transfer points or tanker connections should also be contained in a bunded area or the operation carried out over a drip tray. Bunds may need to be protected from damage, for example by vehicles such as tankers approaching to make deliveries. Bunds will need to be checked and maintained to ensure that they do not leak. Any escape may have the potential to cause pollution. Adequately securing the waste might control this risk, but emergency spill or release plans may also be required, along with the necessary personnel equipment and training to put these plans into effect, see topic focus. Waste types, streams, must be segregated to prevent the mixing and contamination of one type of waste with another. This usually requires separate secure storage for each type of waste and the clear identification of types. Appropriate documentation should accompany the waste and the duty of care. To dispose of waste in line with legal requirements, must be fulfilled. 6. Outline the precautions to ensure the health and safety of persons engaged in spray painting activities in a motor vehicle repair shop. As proper ventilation is important when working with paint coatings, a spray booth is an excellent way to remove spray paint vapors and debris from a worker's breathing zone. To provide maximum protection, the spray booth must be properly maintained, including regular cleaning of filters and overspray. When painting in an enclosed space, a room, provide outside ventilation air with fans or open windows and turn off ignition sources like wall heaters. The air purifying type of respirator should be used only during exposure to those specific chemicals, or groups of chemicals, described on the respirator cartridge while the atmosphere supplying type of respirator must be used in some paint spraying operations, particularly with urethane paint saw. When painting in a confined space for example inside a tank, other PPE to be used can be eye goggles and coveralls. Some of the chemicals you work with can injure skin or cause dermatitis. Coveralls and gloves prevent these chemicals from coming into contact with your skin, reducing the risk of damage. Wear your coveralls and gloves whenever working with chemicals. Clean your gloves and wash your coveralls regularly to prevent chemicals from accumulating, especially around the cuffs where they can easily come into contact with your skin. As an additional protective measure, use barrier creams on your hands, face and neck. Check to make use you have the correct barrier cream for the chemicals being used. 
because of the danger of fire and explosion where paints which contain flammable solvents are being used. Care should be taken to remove all potential sources of ignition before starting work. This means naked flames, cutting and welding torches, gas-fired heaters and materials which may give off sparks, whether electrical, mechanical, friction or static, and there must be no smoking. Make sure the correct types of fire extinguishers are available at the work site. Many painting projects require preparation of the materials to be painted. Preparation often involves sanding of the surface which creates a health hazard if dust masks are not worn. Ideally dust collection systems should be used to prevent large amounts of small particulates from entering the air. Sanding and scraping of old paint may hold additional hazards if the old paint contains lead. Understand the information given with the material safety data sheet of the paint being used. For most people who work with a material, there are sections of the MSDS that are more important than others. You should always read the name of the material, know the hazards, understand the safe handling and storage requirements, and understand what to do in an emergency. Hazard Communication Standard, HAZCOM, needs to be implemented at the workplace. The Hazard Communication Standard requires employers to maintain an inventory of hazardous materials, provide employees training on the potential hazards associated with a material, obtain and maintain MSDSs for each material on site, establish proper methods and types of labels, and inform contractors of the hazards that their employees may be exposed to in their work area. Step ladders are commonly used for painting. Ladder safety begins with selecting the right ladder for the job and includes inspection, set up, proper climbing or standing, proper use, care, and storage. This combination of safe equipment and its safe use can eliminate most ladder accidents. One of the most common health hazards associated with exposure to solvents is dermatitis. This can be avoided by use of substitute solvents which are less hazardous to health. Use of safety signage with no smoking, no welding to be posted. Grounding of all spraying equipment. 7. Identify the sources of information which could be used in the assessment of risk to toxic substances. The hazardous nature of the substance present, is it toxic, corrosive, carcinogenic, etc. The potential ill health effects, will the substance cause minor ill health or very serious disease and will these result from short term or long term exposure? The physical forms that the substance takes in the workplace, is it a solid, liquid, vapor, dust, fume, etc. The routes of entry the substance can take in order to cause harm, is it harmful by inhalation, ingestion, skin absorption, etc. The quantity of the hazardous substance present in the workplace, including the total quantities stored and the quantities in use or created at any one time. The concentration of the substance, if stored or used neat or diluted, and the concentration in the air if airborne. The number of people potentially exposed and any vulnerable groups or individuals, such as pregnant women or the infirm. The frequency of exposure, will people be exposed once a week, once a day or continuously? The duration of exposure, will exposure be very brief, last for several hours or last all day? The control measures that are already in place, such as ventilation systems and PP. 8. Identify the sources of information available in material safety data sheet. Identification of the substance or preparation and supplier, including name, address and emergency contact phone numbers. Composition and information on ingredients, chemical names. Hazard identification, a summary of the most important features, including adverse health effects and symptoms. First aid measures, separated for the various risks, and specific, practical and easily understood. Firefighting measures, emphasizing any special requirements. Accidental release measures, covering safety, environmental protection and cleanup. Handling and storage, 
recommendations for best practice, including any special storage conditions or incompatible materials. Exposure controls and personal protection, any specific recommendations, such as particular ventilation systems and PPE. Physical and chemical properties, physical, stability and solubility properties. Stability and reactivity, conditions and materials to avoid. Toxicological information, acute and chronic effects, routes of exposure and symptoms. Ecological information, environmental effects, which could include effects on aquatic organisms, etc. Disposal considerations, advice on specific dangers and legislation. Transport information, special precautions. Regulatory information, overall classification of the product and any specific legislation that may be applicable. Other information, any additional relevant information. For example explanation of abbreviations used.